1870. Napoleon III is Emperor of France. The British Empire looks like this, and Ulysses S. Grant is the President of the United States. It's the era of the Second Industrial Revolution, and some great stuff is about to be invented. Railroads, steel, machinery, steam power, telegraph, petroleum, electricity, combustion engine, whatever this thing is. The economy is doing great. And it'll probably be great forever, just kidding. Except it wasn't, and it was almost immediately followed by a depression. A depression so great it was called the Great Depression. And it was called that until there was an even greater depression. And then it started being called the Long Depression instead. But it really was a Great Depression. In the US, 18,000 businesses went bankrupt, including 89 railroads. Those who had work, worked for 10, sometimes 12 hours a day, six days a week. Which means that if you work 12 hours a day and sleep eight hours a day, you only have four hours a day to spend with your family. Chicago, at the time a major industrial center, had become a hotspot for organized labor. And where there's organized labor, there's organized union busting. Known union members were fired, put on a shared blacklist so that other companies would know not to hire them, Companies would do lockouts, hire strike breakers and spies, as well as thugs and private security forces to beat strikers into submission. August Vincent Theodore Spies, born in Germany on December 10, 1855, in a ruined castle converted into a government building where his father worked as a forestry official, came from a privileged background. But in 1870, when his father died, he had to emigrate to America to find work. He started working as an upholsterer in Chicago and became involved in labor activism in 1871. And like many German immigrants in America at that time, he joined the Working Men's Party of the United States, one of the first Marxist-inspired political parties in America. There he also met Albert Parsons, George Engel, and Michael Schwab. Adolf Fischer, Samuel Fielden, and Louis Ling weren't members of the party, but they were anarchists and became involved with the labor activist scene in Chicago. 1871 was the year of the Paris Commune, and although it had quickly fallen to the French armed forces, it had also displayed for the first time that a socialist revolution was possible. Change was in the air. But the Working Men's Party was mainly concerned with electoralism, they wanted to turn America socialist through the ballot box. But that didn't sit right with many of the German members who weren't citizens and therefore couldn't vote. So a new revolutionary faction emerged, mainly led by the Germans, and they promoted union activism and direct action. In 1882, one of the electoralists was ousted as editor of the workers' newspaper in Chicago, the Arbeiter Zeitung. In his place, one of the anarchists was installed, our friend August. Also involved with this newspaper were Michael Schwab, Adolf Fischer, and Samuel Fielden. This rivalry between the Marxists and the anarchists was unsustainable though, and it inevitably led to a split in the party, with the electoralist Marxists going off to form the De Leonist Socialist Labour Party, and the anarchists creating the Black International. But the anarchists were also split among themselves between the non-violent anarchists who wanted to use strikes and protests to achieve their goals and the radical faction who wore military uniforms, marched with muskets and made bombs. August was one of the non-violent anarchists, as were Albert Parsons, Samuel Fielden and Michael Schwab. Adolf Fischer, George Engel and Louis Ling were of the more radical brand of anarchism. The radicals' plan was that if they could just defeat cops in various industrial centers in America and seize some means of production for the workers, everyone in America will realize that anarchism is great and rise up to destroy capitalism spontaneously. It's a foolproof plan, as we will surely see. 1884, the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions decides that in two years, May 1st, 1886, the eight-hour workday will become standard. The idea is that from May 1st forward, all unionized workers will go to work as normal, but after eight hours are up, they will blow a whistle to signal that the workday is now over and they will go outside to form a picket line. So then the day came, May 1st, 1886, and between 300 and 500,000 workers went on strike and held rallies all across the United States, calling for an eight-hour workday. On May 3rd, August Spies, 
held a speech outside an IHC factory in Chicago, urging the workers to remain non-violent. However, after the unionized workers had blown the whistle and walked out, they encountered strike breakers, newly hired workers who weren't union members and who were essentially paid to force their way past the striking workers into the factory. And although strike breaking was a common tactic, what was uncommon about this occurrence was that they were escorted by 400 officers of the Chicago police. The unionized workers formed a picket line, the strike breakers attempted to cross it, arguments broke out, and the police started firing. Six of the unionized workers lost their lives on that day. August later testified about this event, quote, I knew from experience of the past that this butchering of people was done for the express purpose of defeating the HR movement. Outraged by the police violence, a group of radical anarchists, including Adolf Fischer and George Engel, printed a bunch of flyers calling for workers to arm themselves and take revenge upon the police. August, who had urged the strikers to be non-violent, asked his comrades to not encourage people to bring weapons. And they eventually agreed. Most of the flies were destroyed. The next day, May 4th, there was to be a peaceful protest against police violence in the Haymarket Square. August held a speech. There seems to prevail the opinion in some quarters that this meeting has been called for the purpose of inaugurating a riot. Hence these warlike preparations on the part of so-called law and order. However, let me tell you at the beginning that this meeting has not been called for any such purpose. The object of this meeting is to explain the general situation of the 8-hour movement and to throw light upon various incidents in connection with it. The Chicago police eventually moved to disperse the crowd of protesting workers. And despite the fact that August had urged his comrades to not bring weapons, someone threw a dynamite bomb toward the police. And from there, everything spiraled into chaos, ultimately resulting in 11 deaths, 130 injuries, and over 100 arrests. Following the incident, the police clamped down on unions and activists even harder than they'd done before, in what some call the first Red Scare. They raided homes, they made arrests with little to no evidence, and they specifically targeted German immigrants. The radical anarchists had of course hoped that once the American people heard of their brave fight against capitalism and the police, they would all rise up throughout the country to help dismantle capitalism. But the media largely sided with the police, and the public became alarmed at this so-called riot the anarchist caused. The story became known internationally, and although people in some countries seemed sympathetic to the anarchists, in America the consensus was that clamping down on organized workers was necessary to keep the peace, and labor unions such as the Knights of Labor distanced themselves from the anarchists and the use of violence, probably out of fear that they too would be swept up in the Red Scare if they didn't shy away from the more radical factions of the labor movement. The police were already convinced that the anarchists had planned to use violence. They just needed to prove it. And so they raided the offices of August Spice newspaper. There they arrested him along with Michael Schwab and Adolf Fischer. The police found the poster calling for revenge, which August had railed so hard against. It was one of the few copies of the original flyer that August hadn't destroyed. The police also arrested Louis Ling. Honestly, I could make an entire video about Louis Ling. The man was a legend. He also really loved explosives. The police found bombs and bomb equipment in his home. Seven people were arrested under suspicion of throwing the bomb. August Spies, Michael Schwab, George Engel, Adolf Fischer, Albert Parsons, Samuel Fielden, and Louis Ling. So let's just quickly go over what each of them did on the day of the Haymarket affair. Michael Schwab was only at the Haymarket for five minutes. He then went to hold a speech at another meeting of workers where he remained for the rest of the day. George Engel, who'd called for violent revenge against the police, but was talked down by August the night before the protest, chose not to go to the Haymarket that day, but instead stayed home and played cards. Adolf Fischer was at the Haymarket to listen to August speak, but then it started raining, and so he went to the local saloon called Seth's Hall, which is where he was when the bomb went off. Albert Parsons had been asked to speak at the Haymarket, He originally declined because he feared that it would cause violence if they held a rally outdoors, but he changed his mind and he eventually showed up, together with Samuel Fielden. They held a speech and then it started to rain, and so he, his wife Lucy and their two children also left for Saf's Hall. Samuel Fielden also held a speech, despite the rain. 
but it was interrupted by the police captain ordering the meeting to disperse, which is when the bomb went off. We don't know exactly where Louis Lang was or what he was doing, but we do know that he was never at the Haymarket on that day, nor was he among the group who the night before had called for a violent revenge. And August, of course, was there. He was the main speaker at the rally. So of the seven people arrested, only two, August and Samuel, were actually at the Haymarket when the bomb went off. George and Louis weren't at the Haymarket at all that day, and Michael was only there for five minutes. Nevertheless, they were brought to trial. And that trial was a complete show trial. The media had already declared them guilty. The judge didn't like the defendants going in, he consistently ruled for the prosecution, he failed to maintain decorum, a motion to try the defendants separately was denied, and anyone who was a member of a union or had any socialist sympathies at all were not allowed to sit on the jury. And most of those who did sit on the jury declared prejudice against the defendants, but were allowed to serve anyway. The prosecution's main argument, seeing as how they didn't have any actual evidence to claim that any of the defendants either did or even could have thrown the bomb, was that because they didn't actively dissuade the guy who actually did throw the bomb, who no one at this point even knows who he was, they were just as guilty as he was. This is obviously bullshit. August had consistently urged his comrades to be peaceful and non-violent, but this wasn't taken into consideration. The trial was a mess, and it's no surprise that the governor later pardoned the defendants, calling them victims of hysteria, packed juries, and a biased judge. But this pardon would come too late for all but Michael and Samuel. The jury returned all guilty verdicts, and all seven were sentenced to death by hanging. Albert Parsons had actually voluntarily turned himself in. He thought there was no possible evidence against him, seeing as how he wasn't even at the rally when the bomb went off. He turned himself in out of solidarity with his arrested comrades, and now he would hang. Michael and Samuel had their sentences changed from death to life in prison, which they served six years of until they were pardoned. Louis Ling was also pardoned, but only after he'd committed suicide in his cell after hearing that he would be hanged. Adolf Fisher, George Engel, Albert Parsons, and August Spice were hanged on November 11th, 1887. As he faced his demise on the gallows, August shouted, The day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. Those words are now engraved on the Haymarket Marchers Monument at the Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois. Before they dropped, they sang the Internationale but to the tune of La Marseillaise. The tune for the International that we know today would only be written a year later, in 1888, the same year that the American Federation of Labor voted to campaign again for the 8-hour workday in 1890, and again the date chosen was May 1st. The Second International also decided to hold a great international demonstration to demand the 8-hour workday, also on May 1st, 1890. This date was chosen specifically to honor the memory of the Haymarket marchers and the other workers who had been killed in association with the strikes in Chicago on May 1st, 1886. The event, the trial, and subsequent martyrdom of these anarchists had sparked international outrage. Although public opinion in America was that these anarchists were monsters and fiends, there were protests in solidarity with the accused in Latin America and in Europe. May 1st, 1890 would become the first International Workers' Day. And although today many may have forgotten why we celebrate on this specific date, for decades after the Haymarket Affair, May Day was celebrated specifically as a commemoration of the death of the marchers in Chicago. Ahí fue una masacre que mataron muchos trabajadores. Y a partir de ese momento se ha tomado esa fecha para la celebración del Día del Trabajador. I realize due to the current circumstances it's impossible to hold a May Day rally this year, but we can still celebrate the day and contemplate the reason we celebrate it. America doesn't celebrate International Workers' Day. It's one of the few industrialized countries which doesn't. But if you're American and you're watching this video, why not celebrate? Rolls stuck at home anyway. If you have a flagpole, fly a red flag. 
or just hang a piece of red cloth out your window, or make a sign, draw a portrait of August Spice, make a cake with an anarchy symbol on it. Whatever you decide to do, send me a picture on Twitter and I'll give you a retweet. We can make May Day a great day even if we can't go outside to rally. Thank you to Joshua Cheeseman, Dunk Junk Funk, Oti Sebuketti, Alel Dev, Jonah R. Brandley, M. Lim, Peter Rhodes, Will M., Cut Play, Laura S., Kuro Fox, Alfie Bridge Smith, Gekabyte, Emil Sigerbeck, Kvagram, John H. N., and Jedi Davian for supporting me on Patreon. Happy May Day. Passez le soyo plus esclave Sous le drapeau rallions-nous Sous nos pas brisons les entraves Quatre-vingt-neuf, réveillez-vous Quatre-vingt-neuf, réveillez-vous Rappons du dernier à la thème Ceux qui par un stupide orgueil Autour vers le sombre cercueil De nos frères morts et sans emblème Oh, oh, la liberté Des frères 